shellfish allergy is a contraindication for radiologic contrast that predicts reactions to it. So this is something that's been sort of promulgated for many, many years and um, we'll find out if it's actually a myth. Okay, Dr. Uh, Megan Kwan will be doing the first presentation. All right, well, thank you for that introduction and for such a lovely framing um, scene. Um, so here's a brief overview of my presentation for today. Um, and I'll just dive right into it. Um, so first you might be wondering, you know, do people actually believe this? Um, when I was talking just throughout the hospital about my upcoming presentation this week, that was frequently the response that I received. Um, and the answer is actually yes. Um, so there have been a few studies on the perception of this myth, uh, whether it seems to be perpetuated more so from the patient side or if there is also a contribution from the healthcare side. Um, and there does seem to be a component of both. Um, this was a small study in 2005. It was a survey of, survey of 75 patients who were known to have a shellfish allergy. Um, they were patients of an allergy clinic that was associated with the university hospital. Um, and in this survey, 65% of patients reported that they were told to avoid contrast because of a concern about an adverse reaction related to their shellfish allergy. A subsequent slightly larger study in 2008 was a survey of about 200 physicians across six academic medical centers in the Midwest. I think my med school was included in this too because one of the authors was from my med school. Um, but two thirds of the participating radiologists and 89% of the cardiologists who participated in the study, two specialties which frequently utilize IV contrast, um, indicated that they do routinely ask patients if they're allergic to shellfish prior to administering it to them. Um, and the minority, but not an insignificant amount of them, 35% of radiologists and 50% of cardiologists reported that they would actually alter their management based on this. Um, so they said that they would either withhold um, contrast altogether or require that a patient be pre-medicated prior to um, administering the contrast if they have a history of shellfish allergies. I wanted to look a little bit more into the origins of the myth. Um, again, this seems to be something that's been brought up um, or just kind of perpetuated both on the patient and the physician side of things. Um, and it seems that two main studies were frequently quoted as um, the source um, in favor of or against the possibility of this relationship. Um, both studies were from in the 1970s. They were both published in the American Journal of Rentgenology and I'll go into them in a bit more detail. So the first study was in 1973. This was a prospective trial of approximately 33,000 patients um, at Mayo Clinic who were undergoing a contrast study called excitatory urography. Um, patients were evaluated based on a history of allergy or hypersensitivity or an absence of this. If they did report an allergy, um, it was inquired what specifically they were allergic to and what was the nature of their hypersensitivity reaction. Um, in general, of all of these patients who were exposed to contrast, it was generally well tolerated. 93% um, of patients had no clinically significant response at all. 5.1% um, of patients had minor side effects. So this was note of some sort of symptom resulting from contrast administration, um, but it was fleeting or it didn't require any sort of intervention. Um, and 1.72% of patients had acute reactions. Um, I have included you know, the different kind of range of reactions that patients experience as a result of receiving contrast. Um, this range from more typical allergy type um, symptoms such as hives or um, mucosal edema or more on the severe side, um, arrest, shock, and then one death in total was reported across this entire study. Um, a smaller subsection of the patients who were evaluated in this study um, were more closely examined for a relationship of allergy or hypersensitivity and in, um, in the incidence of adverse reactions seen in these patients. Um, in general, adverse reactions were 2.5 times, 2 times more likely in patients who had a positive history of allergy or hypersensitivity. Um, seafood allergy in particular was highlighted. Um, I put it in yellow here. Um, I'm trying to use my laser pointer, um, but I highlighted it in yellow here. Um, essentially 6% of the patients who had a reported history of seafood allergy did experience an adverse reaction. Um, they was specifically noted in the study that they didn't record the severity of reactions for all of these patients, but they separately commented that um, these patients who experienced adverse reactions and had a history of any allergy were not noted to have a more severe reaction necessarily. 
Um, and I did want to point out that, you know, 6% of patients who had seafood allergies did have, um, did have adverse reactions, but similar percents were seen in patients who had other um, allergies in general. So you see food allergy was also 6%, asthma 6%. Um, and so seafood was highlighted separately, but wasn't significantly or wasn't any different from the incidence of adverse reactions in patients with other allergies. A subsequent study in 1975 um, by Shahadi was also a prospective study that specifically explored the incidence of adverse reactions to contrast administration. This was conducted across multiple teaching hospitals in different countries. Um, there were about 112,000 cases of which about 5,500 5, had reactions, two thirds of which were minor and one third of which required some sort of intervention. Um, similar to the prior study, the incidence of adverse reactions in a patient who reported a history of any allergy was twice that of the general population, so patients who did not have a, a prior reported or documented allergy. Um, and 15% of patients who had a seafood slash selfish allergy, um, it's the third column, uh, it says 14.98, had an adverse reaction. Um, so as you see, it's one of the higher percentages up there, but not very different from other food allergies. Um, you see fruit, eggs, uh, milk, chocolate are kind of the rows right below, and those are also similar percents. Um, asthma was about 11% of patients who had this also had an adverse reaction. Um, I just wanted to, you know, kind of comment that both studies already um, separated shellfish allergy from other food allergies, and this might suggest that there was already suspicion for a relationship between shellfish allergy and contrast reactions at the time. Um, neither study commented on the statistical significance of the increased frequency of contrast reactions in these patients, um, and then clinically, they did report that there wasn't a difference in the severity of reactions, so not necessarily noted to be seen either. Um, and then neither study concludes that you should avoid contrast in patients um, with history of allergy to anything or in specifically of uh, seafood allergies. Um, and neither study recommended pre-treating to try to avoid symptoms. I wanted to dive a little bit more into kind of the concept of the myth or why this myth might have come to be. Um, from what I was able to find, it seems that the kind of foundation of its possibility is in the fact that both seafood and contrast contain iodine. Um, but looking into this a bit more, it seems that the concept of an iodine allergy in itself is flawed. Um, so iodine is naturally occurring in our bodies. It's present in thyroid hormone. It's in amino acids. It's also a very common food additive, especially in the United States, present in salt. Um, so if somebody did have a true like IgE-mediated allergic um, or allergy to um, iodine, it would be very difficult for them to survive. Um, there have been studies into what component of shellfish in particular is causing people to have shellfish allergies. Um, 34 allergens have been identified and are listed in this database. Um, and I won't go into the full details of them, but essentially it's thought that it's specific proteins within the shellfish that are causing allergic reactions, or that's what people have allergies to. Um, the most common uh, was tropomyosin, which is the protein that helps um, with interaction between troponin and myosin. Um, and obviously that's not contained within contrast media. Um, I looked into a little bit more about the pathophysiology of what does drive contrast reactions. It seems that there is a little bit uncertainty of whether or not it is IgE mediated or there are more recent papers that are arguing for a non-IgE mediated reaction. Um, so non-allergic or anaphylactoid is the term that's frequently used. Um, this 1998 study um, evaluated 20 patients who had a reaction to contrast compared to patients who did not as their controls. Um, and they tried to evaluate for markers of an allergic response, such as serum levels of histamine, urinary methylhistamine. Um, they evaluated for specific IgE antibodies against the contrast media. Um, in general, they found that histamine levels and tryptase levels were higher in patients who did have a response. Um, and they did see a higher um, amount of IgE present in these patients who had a response to contrast, which did or would support um, IgE-mediated allergic reactions as the mechanism. Um, in 2008, um, another study also sought to explore this. It was a slightly larger study, including 96 patients, and they indicated that a patient would have had a IgE-mediated allergy to contrast if based on a positive skin test. So of the 96 patients that were evaluated, only four patients actually had a positive skin test. 
Um, and with these patients, they further followed up to see that if a patient had a positive skin test to one contrast agent, but not to another one, if they would be able to tolerate the one that they had a negative test to. Um, and this was the case for two patients. So both of the agents that they used did contain iodine. They were you know, functionally similar, but maybe the different additive components of it were what were accounting for the patient's allergy. Um, and I think that this could you know, further be extended to say that if a patient is having a response to one contrast agent, it doesn't mean that they need to avoid contrast for the rest of their life. Other agents could be explored. Um, what seems to be more so the um, leading idea behind what is driving contrast um, reactions is a non-IgE mediated mechanism. Um, this 2009 paper that I've cited here um, describes an anaphylactoid response, not felt to be due to the actual like ingredients or components of iodine material in itself, but rather that um, historically hyperosmolar agents were used due to like more iodinated compounds. Um, and they reported that a hyperosmolar fluid in itself acts as an irritant, and that can um, directly activate mast cells and cause vasodilatation, increase capillary permeability, which could mediate the symptoms that are frequently reported with the adverse reactions to contrast. Um, I think that this kind of concept was further substantiated by a 1990 study. Um, this was a large, like greater than 300,000 case um, study conducted over Japan, comparing the incidence of patients having adverse reactions to contrast who received a higher osmolar ionic compound versus a lower osmolar agent. And it was seen that the use of a lower osmolar, osmolality contrast media, um, media was associated with a significant decrease in all reactions and a five-fold decrease in severe reactions. Um, I kind of wanted to close um, in showing that uh, this myth has actually been commented on, but by, I think, pretty reputable parties. Um, so the American College of Radiology has this manual on contrast media, most recently updated this year. Um, and it explicitly states that patients with shellfish or um, quote unquote iodine allergies are at no greater risk um, in receiving contrast compared to patients who have any other allergies. And I think that this um, falls in line with the initial two studies that I reported where the percentages of um, patients having adverse reactions with a history of allergies was similar. The uh, Choosing Wisely campaign um, is like an initiative of the American Board of Internal Medicine um, in combination with a statement from the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. And as you can see here, it highlights um, this concept as a myth in itself, um, stating instead that patients with a history of seafood allergy are not at increased risk of anaphylaxis from contrast media. Um, interestingly, though, it, I was surprised to see that there are such strong statements sort of saying that this myth is in fact a myth, um, but looking into the actual sources backing up um, these studies or that they're citing, they primarily focus on the two studies that I initially presented, um, which also I think might have been the source of why this myth came to be. Um, so perhaps it was a misinterpretation or a misreporting of that data, um, specifically only focusing on, you know, this percent of patients with seafood allergy had adverse reactions and not considering the larger picture that patients with general like atopy in general or with general like hypersensitive states or asthma, other allergies were the ones that um, were having more adverse reactions. Um, so in conclusion, I do feel that um, regardless of the lack of studies explicitly exploring this, um, the pathophysiology doesn't support a relationship between shellfish allergy and contrast media. Um, and so I do think this myth is untrue. Um, and I didn't put this in my presentation, but I also wanted to kind of summarize some of the things that I found. Um, it has been explored whether there would be benefit to pre-medicating somebody with like steroids or antihistamines prior to administering contrast if they're perceived to be a high-risk patient. Um, and that also wasn't found to be beneficial. And that's it for my presentation. I welcome any questions. Yes. <laughs> I don't expect you to know the answer for this, but I wonder if you were to look at the labeling for the approved label for any of the contrast agents that are being used currently, mm -hmm. I wonder if there's been any effort retroactively to go back and modify them so that they no longer continue to propagate the myth. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, and I also wondered if maybe you do know the answer to this one, what the cottage radiology department's um, perspective on this is or policy or procedure is on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, both good questions. Um, you're correct. I don't know the answer to them. Um, I think that would be an interesting thing to look into. And I'm, I'm actually not sure what they use here, what the typical policies are either. Um, yeah. I'll weigh in on that. Okay. Um, I don't know about the answer about the package inserts. I'm not sure if it, <clears throat> if it ever said it or if it does currently. I haven't, you know, the contrast has really changed over the years. And it used to be, what was called ionic contrast. Now they use non-ionic contrast. And the incidence of reactions with non-ionic contrast, I think as she pointed out in that Japan study, is markedly lower than with the older agents. Um, you know, Monica's, my wife's a radiologist, and she said that when they used to use the ionic contrast, they used to have a couple of reactions per day. Um, and now it's rare. To, and I'm talking about not anaphylactic reactions, I'm talking about anaphylactoid reactions or hives and things like that. <clears throat> as far as your second question, I did actually contact the radiology department yesterday about this just to find out if they were screening people for this. <clears throat> and the uh, tech that I talked to said, uh, well, we don't really, we just asked the patient if, they, if they've ever had contrast before. Um, I thought they had to fill out a form beforehand or something. And he said, we do have a form, but we don't really use it. Um, but I said, well, can you, can you email it to me? So he did send it to me and it wasn't on the form. And the form was dated 2013 was the date on it. So it, they probably haven't been doing it for asking about it for a while, but it used to be pretty common. Um, okay. So with that, you know, I, um, as Dr. Kwan said, I was also very struck by the fact that there's almost no data on this to support it. I don't even know, even the original studies that is supposed to be the origin of the myth didn't really show that it was any more common than any other kind of allergy. So I'm not sure where it all came from, uh, but a lot of people, as you could see from those surveys were misinformed. A lot of patients were afraid of getting contrast or told not to get contrast, okay. So <laughs> it's time to vote. Is it a myth? Shellfish allergy is a contraindication for radiologic contrast and predicts reactions to it. So how many people think that this is true? How many think it's plausible? How many think it's confirmed? This is busted. Yeah. All right. Oh, you get it. Get to push the button. So just, uh, just tap, tap, tap the pad. Is it not working? <laughs> is it because something's happening? Oh, is that it? This happens every time. Glasses on. Um, Which ones is it supposed to be on? I don't it's know. Supposed to be I don't on, options <laughs> there now do it oh, sorry yeah. All right. couldn't deprive her of that opportunity <laughs> 